We hear all the time that we're in the midst of an information revolution. Like the Industrial Revolution, it involves a form of automation. That is, the transfer of labour from human to machine. Unlike the earlier Industrial Revolution, this revolution does not involve the automation of physical labour, but rather the automation of intellectual effort. We cannot with any certainty predict the consequences of the changes we witness almost daily. If the trend in AI development and information technology continues, the consequences may be far more wide-ranging than those experienced during the earlier Industrial Revolution. Yet for all the importance of these technologies and the ubiquitous nature of computers, people still tend to think of computation itself as being primarily about numbers and computer science as being only concerned with the production of mysterious acronyms. I promised many months ago that I would be bursting a few popular myths relating to computer science, and the most fundamental myth is that computation is about number. This is a common perception, and if you believe this is true, you would be in agreement with Charles Babbage, so you would be in some very good company. But this was not the view taken by Ada Lovelace whose achievement was not programming, that's a common misconception. Her true achievement was that, unlike Babbage, she perceived the true nature of computation and its implication. Now, to claim that computers don't simply crunch numbers might be considered a rather bold statement, so I think I should justify that statement before we move on. But we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves at this point. So consider this simple question. What can we represent using a single bit? A bit being the smallest unit of information, which as most people would know, is a single digit, which can take the value of either 0 or 1. Well, that single bit might represent true, false, on, off, 0, 1, high, low. The interesting thing is that only one of these representations is actually a number. The first is a logical statement, the second represents a physical state, and only the third might be considered a number. So the question is, when we consider a modern digital computer, internally, is that machine simply changing physical states that we then interpret as representing number? Let's consider another simple problem. 2 plus 2 equals... Did you get it right? The chances are you did so without resorting to the use of fingers. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an example of computation. Does this make your brain a computer? Well, I would suggest not. It is a brain, but at least one part of that organ is obviously capable of computation. In fact, historically, a computer was simply a person who was employed to do routine computations, like compiling logarithmic tables. Many might argue that the brain itself is fundamentally a computer. If that were true, then it would imply that thought itself is simply computation. Most people have played video games and know that the virtual environments they see in such games are computational simulations. But some have argued that the real universe itself, at a fundamental level, is performing computation that quantum physics is really about information, and that matter and energy are really just abstractions built from information. That's an interesting thought, but if the universe is considered as performing computation, then that begs the question, what isn't computation, and what does it mean to say that something is, or something is not, computation? Babbage was primarily concerned with maths, He was focused on the problem of automating the solving of polynomials. His difference engine and the later analytical engine was genius given mechanical form. At that time, nearly everyone thought of computation as being a mental operation involving numbers. And being a mental operation, it could only be done by people. Today, it is easy to underestimate the impact this demonstration of mechanical computation made on those who witnessed it. These days, of course, nearly all computation is done by machines of one form or another. But even so, we tend to associate certain functions with thought, even if we know they are the result of a purely mechanical process. In Western culture, we regard our capacity for thought as the central distinction between ourselves and other species. 
we also view our thoughts and feelings as being fundamental to our own personal identity. So, thought is central to both our collective humanity and of our individual identities. If we were to change our ideas about the nature of computation, and that impacts our ideas about thought, this will inevitably affect our notions about our own nature. This concern, often unconscious, finds expression in popular culture. HAL 9000 and the cyborg killing machines controlled by Skynet, to name only two. Science fiction has been exploring these themes for many decades. And yet, for all our collective fascination with computation, what we mean by the term is still somewhat mysterious. In the introduction, I said that computation isn't fundamentally about number, but it would be a good place to start. So let's think about arithmetic, because I think we can all agree that it's an example of computation, and we have already considered one example. What is 2 plus 2? This might seem a trivial question, but you would be wrong. There is nothing trivial about a child's ability to grasp simple math or to memorize multiplication tables. If you ask a child what is 2 plus 2 and they reply 4, then they have just performed a computation. So, for the time being, let's think of computation as a kind of question answering. In the case of addition, the question always involves a pair of numbers, and the answer or output is always another number. The answer is always determined by the input numbers. We might consider this as a three-stage process. We have inputs, some form of process, and then an output. The output is always determined by the input. Now the part we're actually interested in is the bit in the middle, because this is where the computation happens. For now, let's regard the middle part of this process as some kind of transition. This transition may have one or many steps. The transition itself might have many physical forms. It might be, for instance, mechanical, like the gear trains we see in Babbage's engines, or it might be electromechanical, or it might be purely electronic. But regardless of how it is implemented, there will always be some form of transition from one state to another. So let's now move on to a slightly more realistic mass question. Suppose you ask someone, what is 3,682,679 plus 7,482,301? Unless they are gifted, or at least very good at mental arithmetic, they won't be able to keep all the numbers in their head. So they'll have to use pen and paper to write down the two numbers, and then perform the addition on paper. But now, the arithmetic is no longer just a mental or cognitive operation. It's also a physical operation. It involves manipulation of physical objects, like the pen and paper. We're used to thinking of arithmetic we do as being purely mental, something that takes place in our heads. But in this case, at least in part, it is disembodied. That is, the process is not only taking place in the person's head, but also involves the physical manipulation of the environment. In this case, the use of pen and paper. But other examples might be the abacus, or the classical Greek philosopher's use of pebbles, which is where we get the term calculation from. Another change from the 2 plus 2 example is that while we presented the numbers to the person as a set of sounds spoken in English, in this example, when writing down the two inputs, they would have represented the numbers as symbols on paper, presumably using Arabic numerals. What's interesting here is that none of these differences actually matter. As long as the person comes up with the right answer in whatever representational system or systems they happen to be using, what do we care? We consider them to have successfully completed the task. To put it another way, it doesn't matter which path we take to complete the calculation. Any method that consistently produces a correct result is good. We'll call this the principle of behavioral equivalence. If a person or system reliably produces the right answer, they can be considered to have solved the problem regardless of what procedure or representation they use. Behavioural equivalence is absolutely central to the modern notion of computation. If we replace one computational system with another that has the same behaviour, the computation will still work. Well, that was quite a lot to cover. What were the important points? 
First, we learned that computation can be described as a process. And this process involves an input, some form of transition or state change, and then an output. When described this way, it sounds rather simplistic. But the devil is always lurking in the detail. We also touched on the concept of behavioural equivalence, which not only explains why mechanical machines might produce the same result as electronic machines, but also why we can move from vacuum tube to transistor. We can see this concept played out in the real world by viewing a graph of Moore's Law. We're not so much concerned or interested in the trend at this point, but if we look at the graph at the top, we see a transition from relay to vacuum tube, or valve if you're British, and then a transition to transistor, and finally the development of integrated circuits. The point I'm making here, which may surprise a lot of people, is that many of the functions that Charles Babbage incorporated in his design of the analytical engine can still be found in the modern central processing units of today. We have already touched on several issues that might concern the mathematician, philosopher, physicist and cognitive scientist. It's tempting, isn't it, that when confronted with the brain's capability to perform computation, to assume it is merely a computer. Yet this opens a can of philosophical worms. If state changes are central to our understanding of the nature of computation, does this mean that all state changes are computations? Well, that might be a question for the physicist. I have only described in this video my understanding of computation. What I haven't done is offered a definition. I have several such definitions on my desk, none of which is entirely satisfying. So I shall throw out a challenge. If you had to make a dictionary definition of computation, what would it be? And would the definition be different depending on whether the author was a mathematician, philosopher, physicist or cognitive scientist? I would be interested to see what definitions you guys might come up with. Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like, or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.